Has the Bank of England announced, Leighton? Um, the finest economist of his generation, Ushtiak. What's, what's the Bank of England's announcement? William? Oh yes, William, that is superb. Yes, we want to be have our finger on the pulse of the economy. 150 billion. The Bank of England has announced another 150 billion pounds of what we call quantitative easing. That probably doesn't mean anything to you, but yeah. It's another 150 billion to try and sort of prop up the economy in these very desperate times. Thanks. Uh, William, where did you uh, hear about that, see about it, read about it? Every morning on the bus, I go to uh, BBC. Oh, that is, that is music to my ears, that is. Every morning on the bus, he, he, what, you go through your news feed, is it? BBC News or something? Oh, that is tremendous. Love it. That's what you should all be doing, be it on the bus, in the car, whatever. Checking out the news, keeping your finger on the pulse, the economic pulse of the... The, the country, the nation, the globe. That's what you should be doing. That's what I do, William, every morning as well. So the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is fire on the phone, get the Economist app up, see what's happening. Then we flick to the BBC. Then I get into college. Then I look on the Financial Times. Then I tweet out all my Financial Times articles ready for my article, which I do for them every Friday. So write them an article and some questions. And then... Yeah, start the working day properly. Tremendous. Right, okay. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at something called the intent statement of the economics department. Now, every department in college in recent months has written one of these statements. You may or may not have gone through a similar thing in other departments. I don't know. However... It is very, very important that you know the content of this document, not word for word, but that you have a general flavour of the content of it for a few reasons. Number one, it will help you to understand very straightforward things like what's the difference between micro and macroeconomics, which I know we've talked about, but even when I asked some of your colleagues in year 12 the other day, they weren't exactly 100% sure on that. So I want to give a bit of clarity to that. It also gets you thinking about the, th the reasons why you study economics. So some of you might be here, you know, the, the greatest economist of his generation there, might be here because he knew that he had an aptitude for it. He knew that he had an interest in it. But some of you will have chosen it because you might be friends with the greatest economist of his generation and you've kind of been coerced into it. And some of you might be here because you thought, oh, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Let's just see economics and see what that's all about. So there'll be a whole range of reasons why you're here. But hopefully this will be, provide a little bit of clarity as to why, why you study, studying economics is very, very useful and what you might do in the future. And then thirdly is a more broad, wide-reaching thing, which is to do with the fact that regardless of what subject you study, it opens your eyes, hopefully, to the world beyond what is in the textbook, beyond what is in the exam specification. And economics, I think, is great at doing that because as your learning colleague Williams just pointed out, it's actually got him in the morning flicking through news feeds. Now that will be economics news, but it will also be things about, you know, just current affairs, just keeping yourselves up to date, which is a great thing to do. Okay, so let me explain the structure. There are three bullet points at the start and then there are further few paragraphs. Paragraph one stems from bullet point one. Paragraph two, further down, stems from bullet point three, two. And paragraph three from bullet point three. And then there's an overall summary. On the reverse side of the sheet, you can see we have a kind of an explanation as to why we do micro in year 10 and then why we do macro in year 11. So we'll start here and we'll work through and at various points I want you to stop to underline and this document needs to be kept on your person all the time. So I'm not going to ask you to keep this in your exercise book. I want this to be maybe in some sort of ring binder, maybe that you can bring to school every day, but you need to have this with you every day. And I'll when we get to the end of this, 
I'll tell you why it's really important you need this with you every day. Okay, so uh, Amber, is it? Yeah. Uh, Amber, okay, Amber's going to read um, bullet one for us, please. Thank you, Amber. <coughs> Examine dynamics of human behaviour, both micro and macro level. Examine the Okay. Would you, would you read that again, please? Um, examine the dynamics of human behaviour, both micro and macro. Right, levels. stop there. Okay, so micro and a macro level, please, ladies and gents. Let's get that underlined and let's just pick apart what we mean. So, Grace, what's the difference, please, between micro and macro? Okay, Sean? Okay, so at the very beginning of your GCSE economics, we did discuss the difference between micro and macro, but it is super, super important that you know the difference. So micro, we just take that off in this direction. Micro, if I said to you, give me a scientific word, which contains the word micro in it, and Sean's got it already, thank you, Sean. Microscope, right. Now, what do you use a microscope for, Sean? To look at what sort of things? Um, things okay. that are really small. Thank you. Things that are very, very small, indeed. So when we think of the micro economy, we are looking not at the, the global economy, not at the, the national economy even. We're looking at the economy in very, very small aspect. So really, we're looking at individual firms. We're looking at individual consumers. We're looking, as we did yesterday, we're looking at individual workers. We talked about builders yesterday and derived demand. <laughs> Almost brings a smile to my face, that word. So we're looking at those on an, in, and Dylan's as well. We're always looking at those on a very individual, small scale. We are using a microscope, you know, in the hypothetical sense. We're using a microscope to zoom in on these individuals. Macro, on the other hand. Macro, we're talking, we're not talking small scale, we're talking very large scale. So that means rather than looking at individual firms, we're looking at, so what do you call a collection? You know, a gaggle of geese, right? So, you know, the collective noun. So what, what do you call a collection? Pemba had her hand up even before I had asked the question. Thank you. Well, and what would the question be? What's a group of firms? Very good. So we're then looking at industries, so it might be the car industry, so we're looking at Honda, Toyota, Nissan, Volkswagen, Audi, Ducati. You know, we're looking at all of those all together. So we're looking here at what we call aggregates. So sum totals. So how many cars are produced in total in the economy rather than just well, how many cars are produced in one firm type of thing. So it's very, very different. Very, very, di very, very important, should I say, that you know the difference between the two. Yes. So an industry is a collection of firms. Correct. So if we're talking about the car industry, Helen, we'd be talking about all of the manufacturers, Volkswagen, Nissan, Renault, etc. Whereas if you said a car, a firm, then you might just be thinking, Helen, the most efficient car plant in Europe, which is on our doorstep, which is Watashi Wonamai Nissan. Yes. Okay. Amber, carry on. Oh. Oh. Um, thereby enabling them to understand how markets work. Okay. How markets work. You know how markets work. We've done it already. How do markets work? 
with product very good. So we've got product markets and factor markets, but you haven't answered my question yet. How do they work? So again, well, that's where they're operating. That is true. Ruby, how do they work? There's the clue. How do they work? And exactly, markets are simply functioning on the basis of demand and supply. How do market? Now, this is something new to you. You probably won't. Um, it's not something we've talked about before. But how how might markets fail? So, at the moment, we are in the midst of a pandemic which is bringing the economy to a bit of a, a standstill. As a consequence of that, the most uh, outstanding economist of his generation, what's happening to people in their livelihoods, their jobs? Right, now what's that called when they lose their jobs? Very good. So unemployment is an example of market a market failing and there's a breakdown can anyone think of something else that might happen in the economy which would be classed as a market failure dylan um, consumer confidence. okay and sometimes yeah the the government and the bank i mean actually to come back dylan to what williams just said earlier the bank of england Injecting this money, that part of that is to try and instill a bit of confidence, yeah, in the market. Anything? Uh, changing the money. So if um, the nineteen years dropped. Okay, so that's yeah, that that would be a kind of deficiency, a lack of demand. That's very true. Remember? Uh, recession. Okay, uh, which okay, right? Recession. That's certainly. A market feeling, yeah. What about when prices start to get out of control? What's that called? Inflation. Inflation. Very good. What about... Do we have homeless people? Sadly. Yes, we have. Of course, yeah, absolutely. So, some people have homes, some people don't have a home. So there's a very uneven distribution of what in, in the country? And it's more uneven in some countries than in others. Pemba? Housing. Mm. Yeah, but what do you need to afford your house? Uh, money and income. Income, right. So that uneven distribution of income, again, that, that's a failure of, in the marketplace. And that needs to be corrected. Now, who, who would correct that? Uh, Charlotte, who would correct that? By taking money off the wealthy and giving it to the poor? Who's allowed to do that? Who's allowed to do No, the bank doesn't do that. The government. The government, correct. And how do they do that, Grace? Correct. And benefits. Right, okay. Now, there are lots of market failures, but those are just a few. Okay, carry on please, Amber. Um, and the role of institutions. Right, stop. Institutions, right. What institutions do you know about? So, William, you've already mentioned one this morning. Institution. Bank of England. Now, William, the Bank of England is our central bank, isn't it? Okay, Boris Johnson, he, he's in charge of a big institution um, called the government. government, right? Okay, does anybody know, I'm going to throw one at you here, which you may or may not know, the IMF? International Monetary Fund. Wow. Oh, look at the... Look at the amazement on your colleagues' faces there, Pemba, tip top, yes. The International Monetary Fund. Where have you heard about that, Pemba? Uh, hmm. 
The W, uh, here we'll throw another one out here, see if you know this one. The WTO, it's been in the news a lot because of Brexit. Uh, World Trade Whoa, yes! The World Trade Organization. Where have you heard about that, Kamitha? Uh, on the news. On the news, okay. Any others you'd like to throw in the mix? No? Okay, we'll leave it at that. Is the World Health Organization? WHO, yeah, World Health Organization, yeah, you could have that. Who? Who? <laughs> <laughs> uh, another one there, Dylan, you can have that one for free as well. Right, okay, the World Health Organization. <laughs> Who? <laughs> Who, everyone? <laughs> Love it. Right, okay. What? Two gems in two days. Yeah, two, jokes in two days. Two gems. Two gems in two days. Right, okay. Moving on then. Phoebe's going to do the next bullet. Thanks, Phoebe. Um, model complex economic... Stop. Right. How do you do economic modelling? And you've started this already. What sort of diagrams? Graphs. Okay. But we would call them... What are these diagrams that we do? You're right, graphs, but we call them a bit more than that in economics. Graphs are a bit kind of general. What's on the graph? Demand. Exactly. Demand and supply analysis. D and S analysis. Right, carry on please, Phoebe. Um, processing using theoretical constructs. Um, analyze and evaluate, evaluate, evaluate. Right, the validity. Now, what does that mean? Your learned colleague Louis and the other group, he had a great phrase for this. What's it? Is it Cameron? Louis Cameron? Is that his surname? Yeah. Right. Uh, is it like how valid something is? Okay, now what does that mean? How like, good it is? Official? Well made? How, that is exactly that is exactly what Louis said. How true something is, yeah. How true is it? So is it accurate? Is it evidence based or are you just making this you know making this hypothesis up? Carry on? Right. Articulate your findings in a clear way. That means following that structure I gave you last week. Define on the one hand, on the other hand, conclusion judgment. So that's that kind of, in economics, you need to be numerate, but you also need to be good at writing kind of essay style answers. Okay, and the last one, late on. You looked up at the right time there. Examine ethical. Right. Stop there. Ethical principles. Now, what does that mean? Ethical principles. So, it's one of the really interesting things to me is that when I ask people in year nine who are choosing economics, and I say to them, so well, why do you want to do economics? And they all say, well, I want to know about stocks and shares. And stocks and shares in the GCSE and A-level course is kind of like that, tiny. And then I say, so what else do you, you know, interest you in economics? And th there's not really that many other things that they can think of or say. So one of the things that people think is, oh, well, economics is just about how you make money and how you make loads of money and how you become really, really super rich. But actually, we want you to think, and this is where you'll not, you'll not find ethics in the syllabus, or in your textbook even, and this is, it comes back to actually what Principal Waterfield was saying on Good Morning Emmanuel just a few days ago. We want you to think about things which are, we would consider to be, in many ways, much, much more important than simply the content of the book. So... Boohoo is a great example of a company which at the moment 
is not being particularly ethical. Now, does anybody know why? Apart from the usual suspects here who, who, who've got an answer all the time. Uh, Ahmad. I'm not sure about the children part of it, but certainly... Are they underpaying their staff? Right. So in the paper at the weekend, there was a double page spread and it was all about Boohoo. Do you know how many factories they have in Leicester? One. 150. I, I was astonished when I read that at the weekend. 150. And apparently, and they, I guess they wouldn't be able to print this in the press because Boohoo would take them to court if it was inaccurate. So it must be true. They have been paying many, many of their employees less than £3.50. And I, I've never looked at a kind of boohoo post on Instagram or on the gram or whatever. So I don't really know how it looks. But I, I'm imagining they put across and they portray a picture of kind of wealth, sophistication, glamour, that sort of thing. And very, it is very true that the owners of boohoo, they are billionaires and they are living a life of luxury. And so they're doing all right, thank you very much. But then surely from an ethical point of view, it is totally immoral, and I think moral is mentioned further down, that they should be paying people not even anywhere near the minimum wage, indeed half the minimum wage, less than half, three pounds 50. So I really, that's what we mean by ethics looking beyond what's in your textbook and actually looking to see what's right rather than just oh well we want to make lots of profit and we want you to think about these things even though it's not specifically identified within the textbook we want you to be people who think much more widely and much more broadly about what's going on in the world okay carry on phoebe or william sorry no late on I'm oh, sorry, moral, yeah. Which can affect households, firms, and or governments and consider their place in tackling some of the challenges that face humanity. Right. Again, you might not really explicitly read this in your textbook, but if I said to you, what are some of the big challenges facing humanity? Not just you, just you, the globe, the seven billion on this earth. What are some of the biggest challenges we face? We're in the midst of one big problem, obviously. Right, okay. So, a global pandemic is a big challenge, obviously, in the moment. What else? Istia. Very good. Global warming. Absolutely. Gamitha, what else? Poverty. What sort of poverty, then? Housing. Anything else more basic than housing? Food. Yeah, food poverty, food shortages. You you might you might be aware, you might not be aware, but certainly you know, sub-Saharan Africa we would kind of class as developing nations and there's still millions of people. There's a big article in the Financial Times this morning about Ethiopia. I'm particularly interested in it at the moment because I'm doing that with year 13 at the moment, development economics. And, they, you know, famine has been rife there for many, many, many decades and still is. And poverty and food poverty is something which is, you know, that, that is a challenge which maybe some of you might solve in the future. Greatest economist of his generation there might solve these types of problems in the future. Anything else, Ruby? Okay, nothing. Sean? Sean, sorry, Sean, did I waken you up there? Yes. So having 
ethical, it's a good question. So what are ethical principles? It means that if you were a businessman or a woman in your case, then you would seek to hopefully earn your living not by exploiting people and paying them less than the minimum wage. You would, you would have certain values. You know, we talk here at college about your core values. And one of those is to be of good character, etc. So hopefully that would ensure that you acted in an ethical way. And that just, just to have kind of good morals and good principles. How would you shorten us down? Like, what would you write? How would you? Shorten us down. Like, what would you write? Just to, as in, what does it mean? Like it means to be, I guess, you know, a young man or woman of good character and who will do the right thing. And maybe if you see the wrong thing happening, to speak up about it because all too often people don't. The article in the press about Boohoo at the weekend said people turn a blind eye to Boohoo because many, oftentimes, they're just interested in getting a cheap product. And they, kind of, they just turn a blind eye to the fact that people are being exploited in the production of these products. Right, okay. Moving on. So we've only 10 minutes and I do want to finish this. We're going to blast through this fairly quickly. Uh, thank you, William. I'll read it. Yep. Okay, so this is so that you realize really that there is more to life than just the metro center. There is actually a big bad world out there, a big wide world up there, out there. And you have a hopefully very significant part to play in that. Go on. Right, okay, now this is, that's a very important statement. Some of the most influential economists of modern times. I'm going to throw a few names out here to you. Adam Smith. Picture was on the £20 note for the last few years. Uh, John Maynard Keynes. When did they go to school? Uh, no, they were talking hundreds of years ago. But it, we have one here. We have one, Grace. There he is. There he is. Milton Friedman. Joseph Schumpeter. Now, what do you notice about all these names? Yeah? Who said it? She did. Well, right. Predominantly, on this list, these are all men, okay? Now that is not to say that eco economics is not open to women, and there's a big kind of clamour in big banks and large institutions to get lots of, you know, more women, because it's a very kind of male-dominated sector, economics. So, um... There are a few women who've made their mark in economics. So, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, Joan Robinson, Ste a more modern one, which I'm just reading, the year 13 are just reading the book at the minute, uh, Stephanie Kelton, American. So, it's not to say it's totally male dominated, but it does tend predominantly to be very male biased. Okay, go on. Thus enabling them to critically evaluate their government's central banks and other economic agents coordinate economic Okay, thanks. Who are the economic agents? Who would that be Riaz? Uh, the producers. Thanks. So we've got consumers, producers, and the government. 
Okay, Charlotte, next paragraph. Whose intent? Emmanuel Colleges, right, go on. Right, now this is rather complicated. The classical hypotheses of rationality in perfect markets. What a mouthful that is. So Adam Smith is the founding father, really, of classical economics. So it's something more for A level. That. Go on. Okay, and we've talked about the institutions. Yeah. Next paragraph. Next sentence. Empirical. So uh, evidence based. Right. Okay. Key macro objectives. Now, macro is obviously not what you're doing at the minute, you're doing micro. But you will look at these. There are four macro objectives as follows. Number one, low and stable inflation. Number two, Low unemployment. Number three. Sustainable economic growth. Low and stable inflation, low unemployment, sustainable economic growth. And number four, which I'll have to write down here. A favourable trade balance, which for most countries means that exports are greater than imports. X greater than N is how we would write that. Okay, now we're going to run out of time, but I don't want to just blast through the, the last paragraph and a half. So we will stop it there. Let's now talk about, briefly, before you go, let's talk about your assessment. So I'm thinking we will do it next Wednesday morning, because you will probably need at least a lesson and a bit, I think, to do it. Is that okay?